I work at TensorFlow. We're a comp computer vision startup. I'll say a few words about us at the end. Uh, and I'm not a computer scientist, and I'm not a programmer. I'm a mathematician, so I have a bit different perspective on these things. So the title is Object Detection and Instant Segmentation Part 2. Part 2 because Part 1 happened yesterday, and it was mostly about detection. And I will talk mostly about segmentation. But these tasks, these tasks are similar and uh, very closely related. Right, so we start with a picture like this. So that's what we get. We have a set of classes. We're given, I don't know, 80 classes. There is chair, car, dog, cat, people, person, apple. And our goal is to find, identify these things on the image. So our task, the segmentation, is a, it combines two computer two classical computer vision tasks, which is detection and segmentation. So we want to detect all the instances of the, of, in these classes that are predefined. There are no cats here, so we don't want any cats, but we want to see this dog and these people and this car. So the classical task is like we are given a set of classes and we want to, class, we want to classify, so determine, determine the class of each individual instance, and we want to give a bounding box of each instance in the, uh, in the image. So this is, this is how the output looks like. There are some people here, there is a car, there is a dog. This is object detection. The other task is uh, semantic segmentation. So for each pixel in the image, we want to determine whether this pixel is in one of our classes or it's the background. So here you see we have people, we have a dog, we have a car, but this task does not differentiate the instances. So it just, it merges all the people here. So what we want in the end is want, we want a mix. We want to find the instances and their masks, right? So this is, this is our goal. I feel, I feel like the, the picture gives the best description, description. I don't need to even go into, into details. So we want to identify all the instances and give the binary mask of each instance. It's a difficult task. It's not obvious how to do that. So I'll start with uh, our data set. This is the most common benchmarking data set that exists. It's, uh, have you heard of Coco? Who heard of Coco? Okay. So it was, it's been published by Microsoft in 2014, and it's a very big label data set. It has hundreds of thousands of images in dozens of classes with millions of hand annotated instances. And it was open source and it's available under GitHub, where there were also APIs to, to use that. And uh, also, uh, with Microsoft introduced the detection challenge which was a hybrid between classical classification, detection, and semantic segmentation challenges. So the challenge is exactly what I've said before. Find the instances and find the masks. This also gave birth to some other challenges, for example, key point detections or image captioning or panoptic segmentations. This, there are more and more tasks, these tasks these days. But in general, this is, I would say, this is the birth of image segmentation, of instance segmentation. There, there was data set before, it was called Pascal VOC, but it was very small. This is orders of magnitude, of magnitude bigger. And all research papers on detection and segmentation these days report their results on the COCO data set. Right, so before we actually do any segmentation, I promise we'll do, we, will, we will talk a bit about neural networks, we have to basically define what we are trying to measure. Like, what does it mean if the mask is good? Like it's, not an, it's not an obvious question. How, how do we measure if the mask is good and how we measure that our model works properly? So I will say a few words about uh, methodology that's behind it. So there, there will be some formulae. So there are two basic concepts, precision and recall. That, that's, that holds for basically any statistical study, not only, not only detection. But uh, we have our model, which gives our a set of predictions. And uh, some of them are true, and some of them are, some of them are correct, and some of them are wrong. We, we fix the class, let's say person, and we check all, all the detections of our model. So precision tells us how many of our detections are actually correct. And by correct, I'll explain what it means, but it, it's the pers how, how, how good our, our predictions are. And recall measures how many of, of the objects that were to find we have actually found. So this is, this, 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 the recall measures how, how, how good are we at finding objects. So the recall usually goes up with number of proposals. If we put more proposals, the chance that we found all the objects goes up, whereas the precision goes down. If we spam with proposals, the, our, our accuracy will go down. So what we measure, the measure we use for, uh, for accuracy is called intersection over union, or IOU. And it's a very simple operation. You can do it for box, boxes, you can do it for masks. And, uh, 
It's just a quotient of the area of the, our prediction, of the intersection of our prediction with the ground truth divided by the sum, by the sum of their areas. So if our mask or our, mask or our box covers the, the ground truth perfectly, then it, it, the value of, of this formula is one. If they are completely disjoint, then the value is zero. And there are some positions in between, and it moves between zero to one. Our aim is to get to one. So this is the metric we use. And uh, we say, and usually we, we fix the threshold. So we say that our detections are true positive, so our detection is good if the IOU with the, bug, with the ground truth is, let's say, point half. So it's not, it doesn't have to be exactly on the object we're trying to detect, but, but nearby. And uh, yeah, so I said that precision goes down usually with the, with the number of detections and the recall goes up. This is a simple example. Let's say that these are our, our, our predictions. We, we sort them by the confidence and we can, we, can go, we can go through them and see what happens. So we have our first prediction. The confidence is 0.95, our model is very sure. IOU is 0 0.7, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good prediction, it's a true positive, so our precision is one for now. All our predictions are correct, there is only one prediction. And if I said there are five instances in the image, so our recall is 0.2. We found one image, so it's 20% of all the, well, one, one, one object, so it's 20% of all the objects. Then we take another one, so we, our model said like confidence is 0.22, the IOU is 0.83, so it's a good prediction. Uh, precision is still one because all our guesses were correct, and the recall is now 0.4 because we found two instances out of five that were to find. So now it's 40%. Then we look. Then we go down the list. It's 0.87. The IOU turns out to be to be 0.44. So it's a it's a it's a bad prediction. So the precision goes down because now just two of our three predictions are correct, and the recall stays the same because we haven't found anything new. And we just go through all the list through the list, and we can plot this curve of precision versus recall. This is the plot of 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 this table. So you see that it, uh, the precision, the recall goes up, it goes to one, because we, as, as the number of proposals grows, the, the, recall, the, our target, the number of the objects we found goes up, but the, but the precision usually goes down. And, sorry, this is, this is how a graph of, of, a, of, a, of a model of output, the output usually looks like. So you see that at the beginning, it looks very similar to this. All right, so the, so how do we measure the performance of our, of, of our model? So you want to compute something that is called average precision and mean average precision. So we fix an IOU threshold, so we say true positive, it's IOU over 0.5, and we perform an 11 point in interpolation at the different, different values of the recall. So this is our graph, and we interpolate with such a curve, interpolate it with, with such a curve. So we take the maximal value after, after, our point, after, after the point where we measure it. So we interpolate it points from zero to one, 11 points, and the value of the precision we take is the maximal value that we will find after, after on the right. And average precision is just the area of this, under this orange curve. That's for a fixed IOU threshold. So this was first introduced in the Pascal VOC challenge, this was an old detection challenge with a constant IOU. And on COCO, it's a bit different. They, they introduce something called mean average precision. So you make the IOU move in the, in the step of uh, 0.05, from 0.5 to 0.95. You compute these average precisions, which I described how to compute given, given a fixed threshold, and you take the average, and that's your, uh, that's, your, that's your mean average precision. So when you read a deep learning paper, a paper on instant segmentation or in detection, they are full of these tables with some AP, MAP, APS, APBB, these are these metrics computed. And this is the form of reporting uh, our results. We can also, for example, analyze our algorithms, how good they are for, for images of given size, or how we good at certain fixed IOU. There are many possibilities. They are good for, for checking how our model is performing on different classes of objects. Okay, so that was, let's say, the math introduction, or at least a description of what we're trying to do. I will not talk about that anymore. And uh, now I'll move really to detection and segmentation. So there are three tasks here. Usually we want to detect the object, we want to determine the class or to which the object belongs, and we want to give a segmentation of this object. This can be done using many various, various techniques. It, it's, been done using, it's been done using many techniques. There are different approaches. All of them work, some of them pretty good. There is no unique the right method. Every single year we see new, we see new solutions that, which work. There is no, 
it's not, it's not a given that that certain model will work, and there is not a given that certain models will not work. So the first approach I want to say a few words about is just a brutal bottom-up approach. It does not do any classification, but we take an image, and we just analyze the low-level cues, the pixels, their texture, the light, the, the curvature, the intensity. You usually do it using some classical computer vision algorithms, and this determines interesting, say, areas in the, in the image. And uh, what we want to do is we don't try to patch these interesting areas to form full objects. So this is state-of-the-art uh, instance segmentation in 2004. So you see that doesn't work pretty, that doesn't work well. But these kinds of algorithms, they have really improved during last, during next 10 years. And I, mean, I always give references to, to papers, you can check them out later. This is one example of such an algorithm, multi-scale combinatorial grouping. It's uh, people, People still sometimes use it. There is also one which is called selective search, and you can see it. In, you can play with it in OpenCV. It's implemented. And uh, what's wrong with these algorithms? They use some off-the-shelf methods, like hand-engineered hand feature extraction, and we do not like that. We will eventually want to change that, and we will change that. I'll describe, it, how, describe how to do it. These, are, these algorithms are, are slow, and as these models improve, these algorithms became pretty complicated. And uh, these papers are complicated. It's not, it's not trivial. It's not just let's plug something into a CNN and let it go. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. All right. So what's the second approach? So we can start with some predictions and then try to refine them. So we, again, will use uh, an off-the-shelf algorithm which will give us proposals even of mask or box on masks, and then we will put it into a CNN and see what a CNN can predict. So CNN stands for Convolutional Neural Network. Uh, so that's a very interesting paper. Uh, this guy, Ross Gershik, he, he appears in all of them. Like he's the, he, 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 his impact was enormous in this area. And uh, so how does how this model work? So we extract the proposal, the box proposal and the mask proposal using off-the-shelf algorithm, something like, like they use multi-scale combinatorial grouping. Uh, and then we train two separate neural networks. One of them takes the box. Sorry, this is the input. The, we cut the, the image in the box and we, we pass it through a convolutional net. We also take the foreground for the predicted mask by this algorithm. We pass it through a con other, another convolutional net we stack the predictions, and then we train a classifier on top of that, which predicts the class. So this is a classification. And then they train another part, another net that refines the region. It, it, it combines predictions, it combines the, this, these predictions with this bottom-up algorithm. So it, it's, it's able to refine these masks. Uh, that's another approach. So for, for now, we use pre-computed proposals, computed by some algorithm. This model, uh, it was called Deep Mask, and it was at some point a state-of-the-art model, uh, does segmentation before any recognition. So it just, it given an image, it will give you a mask as an output. So this is the architecture. It's not really important how these architect architectures, these details, how many, how many layers in each convolution, how many channels in each convolutional layer there are. It's all written in the papers. So often it's on GitHub, you can read that. It's more the the approach to the problem. So you see, this is a, this is, we, so the input is an image, and then we have a feature extractor. They used VGG because that was the best feature extractor that, exist, that existed by that time. And uh, by feature extractor, I mean a convolutional, a con, just uh, VGG usually is used for classification, and you just cut chop off the classification layer, and you stop on the last convolutional layer. So usually you have a, I don't know, 1,024 channels or 512 channels of squares of lower resolution because it lowers the, the, the resolution. The resolution goes lower and the number of channels goes up. The resolution goes down and the number of channels goes up. So this is what we do. We use a, we use a, we use a convolutional neural net here, and we'll see that a lot. This is, these days it's a standard. And then we do something. It outputs me a lot of channels with, which are responsible for, for different features. And then we plug that into another part of the neural network, which treats it and does something. So here there were two parts. There was a top part that was predicting a mask, and the bottom part, which is interesting, was predicting whether this, this mask is A, in the middle of the image, and B, whether it represents the, full, the, the entire object. 
So here's the description of how it worked. So it took, it took some patches of the image with the ground truth and the label plus, that's the ground truth, plus minus one, saying whether this object in the image is in the middle or it's not in the middle. And uh, we start with a CNN, as I said, it was VGG. Then there are two branches. One branch takes, one branch tries to predict the mask and the other branch tries to predict, it's pretty artificial, tries to predict whether this mask is really a full object and whether it's inside, in, in the middle of the image. And it was trained jointly, so there were just two tasks, and it was learning two tasks, but, and they did the back propagation uh, in, alter, in alternating order. Alternating order. You, do, don't, you don't do it this way these days, but it was the first very good model. And uh, trained jointly, that's a trap always, because people say they train something jointly. It's very difficult to perform a multitask learning, uh, uh, to perform multitask learning. If your net is trying to learn a few tasks, usually one tasks are harder than others. So for example, it, when you do it naively, you, you will have one task which is learned perfectly and your net will start overfitting to that task, whereas the second task is still not learned and you have these issues. So for example, the, the common solution is scaling one loss. So, uh, so the task that's easier is, lear is being learned slowly. But that's a lot of work, a lot of engineering, and it's, an easy, it's easy to say something was some, some multitask idea, there is a multitasking idea. It's hard and painful to have this model working. I mean, it's, it's just, in, in general, if someone shows you a net and says it works perfectly, it's usually hard work to have all the parameters working and have all the schedules right. So these are the outputs. So what can you do? You can, uh, so one thing, you can just predict masks, and what can you also do? You can, so you can use this, to generate proposals and plug it into the other detectors that were taking like faster CNN that take proposals as an input. So you can use this fully convolutional net to generate proposals and you don't need these bottom-up algorithms. So this, kind, this basically replaced them. And you see also that the, the, the images in, in red, these are the ones that the, this net missed. So it doesn't do well when the images are clustered because when you cut something in the middle of the image, that you will, it will, if, the, if these objects are very close, it will usually just always have them together. On, it will have them together on the image. You cannot distinguish and separate between them. So that's deep mask. And as I said, uh, we we are somehow dependent on the proposals of the of these interesting regions. And uh, there are two things I want to talk about: two algorithms, uh, the region proposal networks, and some pooling ideas. Uh, I think that Zbigniew showed you a bit about proposal networks yesterday, but I want to go in detail because I think it's the coolest algorithm in the whole de in the old detection pipelines that we see these days. So, as always, we start we start with uh, we start with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with our convolutional backbone. We end up with some with some lot of ch lot, lot of channels and lot of and lot of features, and uh, we relied on some on some proposals, some box candidates were interesting, where there were, where, where there were suggestions of interesting objects. And uh, what we can do, we can actually try to make another net network, given this input, predict interesting object in the image. It's possible. And uh, I found it very surprising because it doesn't seem like a convolutional task, but you can actually train a network that does that. And uh, I'll describe that. And what, what's another issue is that these boxes that we, that, that, that we get then as proposals, they're usually of different sizes. So, and we would like to somehow plug it into another network later on. So what we want to, what we want to do is we want to find the proposals and we want to rescale them to the common size and just stack them together so we get, we get one tensor of fixed size. And that's what pooling does. And I will describe these two algorithms now a bit more in, in detail. So, What's the, the region proposal networks takes as an input the feature map, so these lots and lots of channels generated by a convolutional, I call it a convolutional body or first stage convolutional network. It's, before it was VGG, then the ResNest appears, so everyone uses ResNest these days. And uh, it returns a set of bounding boxes together with a prediction whether there is something interesting in the box or it's just background. So it's difficult to actually make a network learn the, the color coordinates of the box, but you can learn some parameter, parameters which allow us to recover the box later. And uh, so if we start with an image with a fixed height and width, then after the CNN, you will have, we have a lot of channels, but the image will get shrunk. So R, it's called the sub-something ratio. It's just every time when we do, when we do some, when, when we take a, 
when our con when our moving our sorry our uh, sliding window makes a step by two, the image the images shrink. So at the end we get smaller image. After this con after this con layers we get something smaller, of smaller resolution. So how do, we, how do we actually find these boxes? These, we introduce something called anchors, and this is a very clever idea. Uh, so at each, at, so this is our, our feature map. It's, let's say it's a grid of, of, some, of some dimension. And at, at the center of each, of, each, of each element of this grid, we place a collection of boxes. In the original paper, faster or CNN, there were nine boxes in total, of different scales. So they, they will try to emulate small, medium, and large boxes, and in different positions, vertical, horizontal, and square. This is fully adjustable. And uh, I'll say a few words about that. So we apply a conv layer that's it's technical, and then we have another conv layer which returns, one is the scores. So for each anchor, each, each of these boxes, this network learns whether this anchor contains something interesting, or it doesn't. And then there is another part which refines the coordinate of the box. So it doesn't return the anchor, but, but it learns how to move this anchor a bit so it, so it fits better to the, to the object it's trying to cover. And it's very interesting because, as I said, it works. You can do that. You can train this net. It will propose the boxes by itself. You will plug an image. You will get the features. You will plug it into this region proposal network, and it will, re it will return better proposals than these off-the-shelf algorithms. And so it's... It was revolutionary. Now it's used in all detection models. I mean, there are no detection models without RPN. They, they basically don't exist. So, we have, so to remember is that there are these anchors, which and we and we teach and we teach the net how to how how to use the anchors. This is how the anchors look look like actually. So we have all these boxes in different scales and try to try to detect objects in different in different in different of different sizes and different scales. So we have these probab probabilities. We have a box. And how do we train this thing? It's actually very interesting because if, if we have a grid, there is a lot of elements in the grid, and for each element in the grid, we have nine proposals. It's like thousands, thousands of anchors. You cannot train them all, it will take forever. So what we do is we sample something. We have the access to the ground truth at this point, so we can say which, which, which anchors are positive, which, have some, which of them contain something interesting, and which of them don't. So we sample with some positive and negative ones, and uh, that's, how, that's, how, that's how we train this, this, this subnet. It's, it's trained jointly, these two tasks. So again, it's a trap. It's, it's not that easy and by no means obvious how to do that. And we finish the pass in the end by non-maximal suppression and some other standard post-processing procedure. And we keep, usually in the original paper, they kept 2,000 proposals. But you will do pretty fine if you keep even 50. You can really speed this part up. OK, and the second part is the pooling part. So, we cut the boxes, we have the boxes proposed by our network, and now we want to resize them so they have a common size, a square size, and stack them together so we have one big tensor which we can then pass to the network. So let's say this is the proposal of our network. It proposes a dog, like, oh, let's say this is, this is a dog. It's a bad proposal, but whatever. That's what it did. And we, then we pass the image through this convolutional, convolutional body, and, it sh and as I said, it it divides the sides by the subsampling sub, sub ratio. So the image that we get after this first pass is 16 times smaller, for example. That's for VGG and 32 for ResNet. And uh, the, you cannot do it with this box because the, the, the lengths of the sides are not divisible by this number usually, and they are in some random points. So you end up with something like this. This is the box on the feature map. It doesn't fit to the grid. So what people did first is they just move, they just cut it and, and try to make the, the corners of the vertices of this box fit the elements of the grid. But you, you lose information here. And it might work OK for detection, but for segmentation, you are losing like 32 pixels. If you round it and the subsampling ratio is 32, you're losing 30, 30, you can lose up to 32 pictures in, pixels in this dimension and up to 32 pixels in this dimension. So it's 1,000 pixels lost. That's a lot of information. And that's only the first step, because we fit, it, we fit, we fit this box to the, to the grid, and then we want to rescale it to something, say, 7 by 7, 14 by 14. These are common, common sizes of the, of, the, of, the, of the output of the pooling layer. So what we do, usually, we have it, we, we have it fitted, and then we divide it, into seven, we divide it into, four, into 7 by 7 grid, the box. And then the vertices of this box, after, after this dividing, they are, again, not in the grid. So we, again, have to fit. The, the vertices of, the, of this box into the grid, 
and do some average pooling or max pooling, but we again, we are losing information. So that's a lot of information lost. And uh, fundamental problem is also you cannot backprop this solution. And uh, so the original paper with the RPN, the authors were training the RPN in, uh, and the RPN and the rest of the network at different times. Uh, but it can be improved. And, uh, and this is something very simple. I was really surprised that this appeared only last year because this is the, the most naive thing one can possibly do. So we rescale, so we pass our, our, our image through the, through the RPN, we pass our box, we get this box that doesn't fit the grid, and, and we don't fit it to the grid. We just say, okay, let's sample some points, co compute its values by bilinear interpolation, and take an average, and that's it. And the value in, in, uh, in, in, in such a bin, like here is two by two, usually we'll do seven by seven or 14 by 14, the value of each such, of each such of each, of each such bin is just the average of these of this, of this values we sampled in, in, in four points. That's it, it's very simple, it's fully differentiable, it, uh, and it makes, it makes the model actually end-to-end. -end. No, no rounding is done, no information is lost. So it's very simple and it's very new, and the people in this paper, I'll talk about this paper a bit more, really did, did all the checking and it, it significantly improves all the results. So this is ROI aligned. There are other pooling methods, uh, ROA warp, I think, which was earlier. I don't know how it works. ROA crop, I don't know as how it works either. This is, this is the method to use. Okay, so I described three models, and now we have this cool package. We have, a, we have an image. We can take the convolutional net, pass my image to the convolutional net. I can, take the, I can then pass it through the RPN, get the proposals, and I can pull it. So the output is just a, is just a one tensor with, with interesting areas rescaled. And now it's a part of, of all good detection models. They, almost all of them start with, uh, with a variation of this idea. So I wanted to present a, a bit a structure that won the first COCO challenge. So uh, this, this is, they, they were the first, and this was the best model in 2015. And they do something very interesting, because usually what we saw in, the deep, in deep mask there was this convolutional body, and then we had two branches that learned two different tasks, and they were trained independently. What they did here is they had more many, many tasks, but they were feeding results of one task into another task. So it was, it was intertwined. So they figured that there are three tasks to learn, basically. We need to differentiate the instances, we need to estimate the masks, and we need to categorize the objects. So it did it in this order. So this is the schematics of this of this net that they did. What really is happening inside is not, that happens often in deep learning papers, that they have some pictures, what's happening inside is not, not at all what's, what's on the picture, but it's, it gives an idea of what's happening here. So the first part is really convolutional network and the differentiating of instances is done by the RPN and they do some pooling. They do ROI warping because ROI aligned didn't exist by that time, but the, area, but the idea is the same. I have my boxes and I rescale them and, uh, and stack together. Then they have some convolutional layers that predicted the masks, and then they feed these masks and these boxes into something with, that predicts the instances. And then it, they, they train it jointly with, with multitask loss. So there are some details of that that I think slides will be available so, somewhat, so you can read that. And uh, they did a very clever thing here also, because you can do it many times. You can, you can get the boxes, then get the masks, then get the classes and new boxes, then get the masks from that. You can, you can do this cascade many times. And what they did, for example, which is very interesting, one, they trained just five, five, five task cascade, but they also did, they trained the three task cascade, and they copy-pasted the two stages here. Literally copy-pasted, without any, any additional training, and it worked better than just, just plain three stage uh, three-stage three stage network, and they have other interesting tricks in there. There are always many interesting tricks in this paper that, you, that one can learn. Uh, right, so I wanted to say a few words about my favorite instance segmentation model. This is, of course, as I said, that's not really what's happening. This is, this is copied from the paper, but that's not really what's happening in there, or at least uh, it's not entirely correct, but it gives an idea. It gives an idea. So the first part, the first line, is exactly this package of RPA, of convolutional body, RPN, and pooling, and it's this. It, it, this is here. So we end up with ROA line. So we end up with with this stack of tensors, and we do our actually we, we do the. Do I have it here? Yep. 
so I'll, I'll go here. So we are, for now, we are here. So we get to the ROI line, we, we want to, we, we pull our boxes, in our boxes proposed by the RPN, and it's a very simple extension of the faster RCNN. So faster RCNN is basically go through like this, do the pulling, and then go up and do the, fa the, the, cl the classical faster RCNN detection with classes and boxes. And this is basically do it yourself, add 50 lines to faster RCNN and get a great instance segmentation model. So, as I said, the first module is the combination of, uh, of feature extractor, regional proposal network, and ROA line, and it's pulled in two ways, in two different scales. The seven by seven scale, it passed to the faster RCNN. You can do it, you, can, you, can, you, can, you have more detector, detectors with, that work this way. For example, cascade RCNN, I'll say, I will not, I'll not talk about it, but this is this, this pulling part, and then the output you plug into a de detector, which predicts a class and a box, and, uh, and then you do another pulling, 14 by 14, and you pass this through the mask part. This mask is just, it's fully convolutional. I think Zbyszek showed yesterday something which is called fully convolutional networks. So it just, what it does is there are four, co four conv layers and there conv layers and there are two upsampling layers. And then it returns a collection of masks for each class and you pick the one that's, uh, that's in the class. That's it, so do, there is faster CNN going up and this extra branch here. It's very simple, it's very modular. There are just some, some parts of this net that you can modify a bit and, and replace, right? If someone has a better detector here, you can cut out the faster or CNN part and you can stuck in your detector and it's gonna work the same. And one interesting thing here is that uh, during inference, it works a bit differently. So you cut out this branch, oh, you cut it and you put it here. So the path goes our box with with the convolutional net, RPN, ROA line, then the faster CNN, it returns a class and a box. We plug this box in here, we do our prediction, and we take the mask that we obtained for this class predicted by faster CNN. It's very efficient, and, uh, uh, and uh, it just works great. It, it, beat, it beat all the benchmarks, and these days the, the segmentation models, they, they, they recycle this idea. So it's a very flexible framework, it's uh, the backbone, this backbone can be changed and people are changing it. People are adding something which is called, for example, feature pyramid network. They, they, they play with what's happening before the pooling and you can do that. You can tinker with that, but in the end, these are just, just a, few, a, few, a few pieces that you stick together. Uh, you can, for example, uh, usually, so people uh, do the RPN on the last layer of rest and you can try with the fourth one. There, you can add feature pyramid network, you, it can be jointly with another detector, so you, cut, you, move, rem, you remove the faster RCNN part and you put something else, like Casker RCNN is the better one these days. This, it can be used for key point detection. It's a, it's a very universal framework. And it was first implemented by Facebook AI re research in Cafe2, and that's not great because Cafe2 is very poorly documented, but the repository detector is very well documented. So if someone wants to play with that, it's very good. All the possible models are in there, all the benchmarks are there. You can train your own models, it's, it's great. And last month, two months ago, they were implemented in PyTorch, which is great because PyTorch is great. Some functionalities are missing, but uh, most of them are still there and it, it's faster, it's lighter, it's memory optimized and it's, uh, and it's greatly supported by the, by the FAIR team. They answer all the questions. So this is, this is a place where you, can, where you can find the code. And I strongly encourage you to look at it because it's also very clean and very well written in a very Pythonic way. So I want to say a few words about, about what we do. So I come from TensorFlight, and uh, we work on computer vision. We do it for property insurance, that's not important. We analyze images, we do computer vision. So we analyze uh, aerial imagery and street view imagery, and we try to detect different objects of these things. <coughs> and uh, it's a learning conference, a conference about learning. So we also learned a few things why when, we, when, we are, when we started our, our, when we created our pipeline, and I wanted to say a few things, how the life of a deep learning researcher looks like, because I'm also fairly new to that, and it was a bit of a shock to me how, how different it is from my imagination. So some of you might start a company at some point, may have, may have a computer vision idea how to do something, and the first thing you need to take care of, really, is hardware, because you, we train on the GPUs, for example, Mascar CNN it takes uh, at least three days on four GPUs of continuous training to get it to the decent accuracy, and if you do it in the cloud, 
you're going to spend fortune. You can go through these providers and ask for free credit. It's going to burn them. You will retrain this model 50 times before you get it to production level. And uh, that's just not efficient. You should you really need to buy your own machines. The ROI, and it's not region of interest, but return of interest of, of investment is around two months. So if you have if you have plans for existing long, for longer than two months, just buy your machines. There is the only that's the only solution. Uh, we spend a lot of time of data sets. This, uh, we're cleaning it. Uh, you cannot escape that. You'll never escape this. We are creating new data sets. We are cleaning it. We are processing it. We are augmenting it. The standard pipeline. Everyone does that. And uh, I never thought that I would say that, but it's a very good idea to label some data by yourself. We have a platform where our labels work. It's, at some point, I spent three days labeling some pictures, and it really opened my eyes how to the... Pro I, I understood the problem quite better, and uh, I found a few sticking points, and uh, it was a very good experience. I strongly recommend everyone to, to label some pictures. And um, the last part is about research methodology, because... Uh, that's important and that's crucial. So always start with a good benchmarking set for your model. Like just have a data set, have a set, have a test set, hide it somewhere, never show it to anyone and test on this set. And make it represent the production environment well. Because it's fairly easy to create a skewed test set and your model will perform great on the test set and it will perform terribly on production. This happens. And it's not, not that difficult to, to achieve. And uh, start with plain vanilla models and deploy them as soon as possible if you want to sell something to someone. Train a ResNet with your data or some modification to ResNet. If the ResNet doesn't work on your data, it means you have wrong data. Because uh, no tricky algorithm will help, will help with that. That's also a good first test if your data set is good. And don't be ashamed of training basic ResNets. Everyone is doing that. People at Google, Facebook, they train ResNets. They're out there on GitHub. Use them. They, are there, they work and they are there to use. Or some other time-tested models if you're not exactly doing image recognition. And uh, be very patient because you will retrain this model 50 times at least before, before they get to a good, good quality. And hyperparameter tuning is painful. This, you have to do that. You have to sit on that. And uh, I mean, you cannot do anything about it. This is, is a part of, it's a part of the game. And in order to have a plan, have a, have a like, strategy, you need, to, strategy, you need to understand how these algorithms work. So for example, I said something about the anchors. The number of anchors, you can choose that. How, how the, the sizes, you can choose that. The scales, you can choose. For example, if you're, if you're trying to detect smaller objects, you would use smaller anchors. And in order to do that, you need to know what the anchor is and how it works. It's, and it's just a, a first example. There are plenty of, of delicate and uh, sophisticated places in the algorithm where you can tweak something and make it, make it work better. And in order to do that, you need to know how these algorithms work. And uh, that's hard because these deep learning papers are usually badly written. It's like just pages, just, uh, just uh, tables and, and pictures. And you will spend time just reading their code, and everything is in their code, and that's where you should, and we should, we should, you, should you should look at. That there are the answers. So this is, uh, this is how our experience is, at least till now. So who we are? Uh, our tech team is CEO, CTO, CTO spoke here yesterday, and we are six engineers with very different scientific backgrounds. I'm a mathematician, we have a physicist, we have a computer scientist, and we have just programmers. We have hardware, we have GPUs ourselves. Double digits more are coming. We have the data, lots of labeled data. We have labelers. We have a lot of ideas, and we are not going to, and we are not able to test them all. So we work with students, with PhD students and master's students. I think that we have two students that are working on their, on their master's thesis with us, and uh, we're just one year old, one, basically one year old. So we are, invite you to ask questions, to to try. Here's our website. Contact us, and we're always happy to help. And I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>